thank you very much for showing up today. Um, my name is Thomas Niedermeyer, and I'm going to present um, our paper on detecting bots on Ethereum. And first, I will define what a bot is. Uh, then I'll pose some research questions that we're answering and how we answer them. So the, there will be included a taxonomy of bots and uh, machine learning experiments. So everything that's, uh, that has to do with it, data processing, modeling, finally the results and the conclusions. So um, what are bots on Ethereum? There are externally owned accounts on Ethereum and code accounts. And an externally owned account can be steered by a user. It can call code accounts, can send either somewhere else. And normal behavior uh, would be, um, one would imagine an address to do some transactions a day, uh, but certainly not um, thousands or tens of thousands or even more and not in quick succession, but this is exactly what bots can do. And this would be um, a typical behavior of bots, but uh, this is the most intuitive one and there are uh, different others. And to come up with a concrete definition, um, I'll have it written here. Um, EO, and the bot is an EOA, externally owned account that has sent a transaction that was created and sent automatically by software without human oversight. That means as soon as one transaction was automated, uh, we consider um, the entire uh, account as a bot. Now, why are bots relevant? Uh, they have some positive effects on the ecosystem. Um, so for example, uh, centralized exchanges would need uh, automated EOAs to manage their assets, to manage um, deposit wallets and disperse uh, disperse funds, and it allows layer twos to automatically deploy data. And this seems to be, uh, this is a more controversial point, but it improves price stability via arbitrage, but as we've heard, it, there's not only, um, and not every party benefits from arbitrage. So there are also negative effects. So there's a financial threat to unwary users, especially by um, use of, of sandwich trades, which um, pump up the price before someone buys, and then directly after the victim's transaction, the uh, asset is dumped again uh, at the cost of the user. The, that uh, uh, bots can send transactions automatically and fast also leads to inflated gas prices and uh, bloats uh, storage requirements for nodes, which nowadays is a, a growing problem. And they also look, um, they're on the lookout uh, at all times for exploits in smart contracts. So there are specialized bots that, um, that they need to be fast because there's competition around this. They scan the blockchain and automatically extract value in this way. So um, there is some literature uh, and systems on detecting bots, especially um, I want to note the software Mevinspect and Eigenfee. These two are very specialized software uh, programs to detect certain kinds of bots. There is um, a body of research on heuristics for bot detection, and there is machine learning for wallet behavior. And bot detection is a subset of wallet behavior, but there hasn't been any machine learning research on bot detection. Doesn't mean that we need, uh, we need to do it, but a good argument for why we want to do it is we only have um, systems that are very specialized on certain bots right now. So maybe Inspect and Eigenfee, they have heuristics that are programmed out. So if there is a new bot behavior, a new bot that we want to um, detect, we can't do it in a data-driven way. We, we have to program it out. So that's the motivation. And on to the research questions. So you see the figure in the, on the bottom of the slide. On the left side, um, that's corresponding to research question one, what types of bots are active on distributed ledger technologies such as Ethereum? What we did was um, we took literature, what's, what's out there, uh, systematizations of knowledge that are already there, um, and combined them with anecdotal evidence um, into a financial bot taxonomy. Um, more on that 
on the next slide. But before that, um, there's also a research question too. Uh, to what extent can we detect bots automatically? Uh, in the figure below, it starts at the red rectangles. We take data from Ethereum. So we have an archive node uh, to extract data. Um, function data uh, from either face, so we can decode um, functions. And data from either scan for annotation purposes. After collecting the data, uh, we perform a feature engineering step on the raw blockchain data, um, create, cre uh, create three data sets out of uh, these features and labels, model the data using machine learning models, and evaluate them. And finally, there is the third research, questions, which, uh, re research question, uh, which features are most informative? Uh, we use um, an explainably IAM method to find that out. So, about the taxonomy, um, it looks like this. And I will not go into each of the classes in here. But um, what's most uh, interesting is how we got to this, uh, to this ta taxonomy here. So on the very left, you have um, maximal extractable value, uh, MEV. So there is uh, already a lot of research on that. Um, also for front, front running, which is part of uh, MEV in this taxonomy. It's also a systematization of knowledge on that. And we try to combine them. Sometimes it's not uh, possible to do it um, in the cleanest way. So for example, front running might be also used in liquidations because um, you have to be uh, the, the fastest and faster than others. And that might um, be considered front running also. Um, but to keep, it, uh, to keep it a good overview um, we separated these two, for example. And so this is uh, what we found in the literature, the, the gray rectangles on the left side. The blue rectangles are what we found in anecdotal evidence. So this could be, for example, um, GitHub repositories. We consider that as evidence. And for example, um, sets of transactions that hint to automated behavior. I'll give you an example. If you find five accounts that um, sent the same transactions in parallel, same uh, swaps uh, for the same assets with the same parameters. So um, this is something that we would uh, see as anecdotal evidence. Right. So now starts the machine learning part. Uh, so you can see here the um, rough overview of 100,000 blocks that we considered. We split it into the observation window, which is 100,000 blocks minus two, because the last two blocks are the test blocks. And they will be annotated. More on that soon. And we take this data. Um, we take the addresses sending in these blocks and split uh, this into three different um, data sets. First is the clustering. We take only addresses sending in the observation window, not in the test blocks. And that is because we later use the test blocks data to, to um, calculate some metrics on the clustering. We have no labels. And the models are Gaussian mixture model and k-means. We took those because they ran um, acceptably fast. And they had the property that uh, we can infer new uh, addresses. Um, after fitting the models, which is not the case for every uh, clustering method. The binary data set uh, only considers um, addresses that are also sending in the test blocks. So we have labels for that, bot and human. We also have some more labels, but I'm not using this for this modeling, this particular modeling here. And to model it, we use random forest, um, gradient boosting, and adder boost. The reason why we took these uh, tree-based models is uh, they perform very well on tabular data sets on um, data science competition websites such as Kaggle. Uh, they are often in the top of the leaderboards. And finally, there is the third data set, the multi-class math data set. We take um, data from the test blocks, but also some um, so addresses sending in the test blocks, but also some that are not, that are found uh, automatically by MEV-inspect. And we have four labels for these. Sandwich, arbitrage, liquidation, and non-MIF. These th first three labels are 
subclasses of uh, maximal extractable value. I'll go back for a second. You can see it here on the left side. Um, I'm talking about these here. And we, took, we take the same models for uh, the multi-class problem as for the binary model, uh, bi binary problem. Um, just the, uh, the multi-class um, version of those models. So for the annotation, as I said, we have these 100,000 blocks. And the last two are the test blocks. We annotate them using two annotators. Um, when they disagree on whether the address is a bot or a human, there's going to be a tiebreaker uh, via a third annotator. And the Cohen's gap is 0 0.77. The interpretation of that is substantial agreement. Um, maybe more intuitive is a percentage agreement of 0 0.89, um, of, of 89%. On the right side, you can see uh, for an annotator what the aggregated uh, labels look like. 132 human uh, labels, and then some some subclasses of um, of bot labels, and so the in the end they are about 50/50. So this is also uh, convenient uh, for for a machine learning problem to not have an imbalanced data set. And additionally, we automatically annotated some data with MavInspect, and you'd think um, first intuition might be um, that doesn't make much sense when we have a model annotating and then training another model on top of that. But the reason we did that was to find out if our feature engineering approach uh, is valid and can find out interesting uh, or telling features so that this can be repl replicated, these labels yielded by MapInspect, the, the software uh, for detecting uh, certain kinds of bots. So this is a core part of this work, um, feature engineering. We um, divided the feature engineering into four parts. Uh, the first one is address-based. So this is the actual address, just a, a string of, um, of characters, because there might be some uh, interesting information in there. Some bots um, use lots of zeros in the beginning to do gas price optimizations. <coughs> then we have uh, transaction-based features so there's especially what's important is time, uh, value of, tr uh, of transactions, um, and some statistics uh, on all of those. So function call based uh, and event based are somehow related. So for example, when you do a swap on a decentralized exchange, when you send it there uh, with your function, with your transaction, you send a function call. And we decoded that for certain swaps. And as soon as uh, it is built into the blockchain, there is events available that you can look into. Um, the reason why we did both is because events are more stable over time, but uh, function call data is more real time. Um, uh, it's, it's possible to use them in real time because they don't need to be uh, already included in the blocks. One, um, one feature I want to highlight is the the sleepiness, um, the gap-based sleepiness, as we call it, uh, it's a measure for um, for how much an address sleeps in our observation window or in our entire blocks considered. And th the exact definition is uh, is found in the paper, um, but this turns out to be uh, quite telling. And also, um, two more interesting features are Benford's law and trade value clustering. They are based on the value. So we use that not only for the value in transactions, but also in swaps and um, in token transfers. And the intuition behind Benford's law is that um, natural numbers that, that, are, that are usually uh, happen when trading, they follow a certain, um, certain distribution. And for the trade value clustering, the intuition is that Humans like to use round numbers, whereas machines do not care if the uh, value used is round. So they take whatever is optimal in their sense. So for the results and the evaluation, to, re to answer research quest question two, for clustering, um, we have different settings of the number of clusters, which we need to, def uh, to define beforehand. 
For 30 clusters, we find that uh, a Gaussian mi mixture model can get up to 82.6% uh, purity. The purity is, for all of the clusters, uh, you take um, from the test set that we have, the labels bot and human, and purity of 90% would mean for one cluster that it's either 90% humans or 90% um, bots. In any case, um, that makes the clusters more interesting when there's a certain suspicion in them so that they're either humans or bots, but not mixed. That's what we don't necessarily want. And the more clusters you have, the easier it is to, by chance, get some pure clusters. So the purity always has to be considered, sorry, the number of clusters always has to be considered when looking at the purity. And for um, binary classification, we got um, a random forest with 83% accuracy. However, the other two models, gradient boosting and adder boost, oh, performed pretty much the same. Um, we got a confidence interval by doing a tenfold cross-validation split. And we have also numbers for the, for the multi-class classification, which are uh, lower, but it has to be said that um, multi-class problem is, in general, a more difficult uh, because there are more options to choose from and more chances to, by, by chance, um, there are more chances for binary classification to, by chance, be correct. And again, with 77% accuracy with a confidence interval and next to it to give you an intuition of how much this fluctuates because our data set is only 270 addresses, you have to check the confidence interval as well. Consider that. Right, um, so to explain how the model gets to its conclusions, we have here the SHAP values. So um, as a short explainer on, on SHAP values, the, when you look at the first, we see, we see the, the figure on the left, and we see the first row out transaction entropy. Um, this is a feature. It's um, a time-based feature, so uh, the block times of the transactions they are distributed over a day, and um, entropy of that uh, is, is this feature. So when it's high, uh, so when the, the dots are red, each dot is an address, um, you see that it tends to be on the right side of the x-axis. This, this means, so this is positive on the right, right side, this means that the model is swayed towards a positive prediction. Positive is bot in our case, and negative is human in our case. So, what this means is, for RTX entropy, um, we see that a high value in this feature means that the model is swayed towards um, um, classifying this address as a bot. And we have four other um, uh, features based on outgoing transactions. So the number of tra transactions per block, the frequency, the maximum gas price of the transaction sent, and uh, the sleepiness that I mentioned earlier. But for the sleepiness, it's like that. It's like the, the opposite as for the others, it seems. So a low sleepiness uh, indicates that it's more likely to be a bot, which intuitively makes sense. We have a similar figure on the right side, which has to be aggregated because it's four uh, categories instead of two. And we can find here that um, especially for liquidations here in the first row, um, the minimum of the gas limit of the transactions and addresses sent is very telling. And all of the others, uh, other top features are also based on, on the gas limit. So um, this is the, the top uh, marker for um, MEV bots, maximal extractable value bots. And to... Um, to conclude this, um, what are the takeaways? So we have a taxonomy of seven bot categories um, with 24 subcategories uh, to answer the question what types of bots there are. Um, for research question two, we find that the average cluster purity um, can be up to 82.6%. Random forest uh, in a binary setting, human versus bot, can get an 83% um, accuracy on our small data set, it has to be said that this is uh, a limitation and uh, it would be best to increase this data set in the future for um, 
more accurate results, results or results that um, generalize better. And research question two, which uh, three, which features are most informative, especially transactions, uh, especially outgoing transactions, um, are informative, and their time uh, frequency of these transactions and the gas price and gas limit are especially telling. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm happy to answer questions.